Welcome to week four. This is Stats versus Film, where we take the tape, show it off to you, and combine that with the spreadsheets, the analytics that this nerd kind of sitting right next to me, Hayden Wink, spits out in the hopes of finding the answer that lies somewhere in between. Hayden, once again, our flagship show, the people love it. How are you feeling after another week of fantasy football? 189 player notes down, about 35 different charts, but more importantly, the film. We got the film, and that's what we're here to discuss. Just quickly, two things. One, I know many of you are panicking after three weeks of fantasy football. It's very easy to make season-long declarations after we have these three weeks of information. I do want to add that after three weeks in the 2022 season, James Robinson was the running back three. CEH was the running back four. Cordero Patterson was a running back five. Greg Dorch, Matt Collins, Devin Duvernay were all top 30 wide receivers. It's a long, long yes, season to go. So don't get too high. Don't get too low. I would just say uh, stay ahead of the competition. Hopefully the show does that for you. And what happens when your mom drops 198 points in you <laughs> on you in week three? What do I well, do Well, she's a viewer. We know mm -hmm. that she's a viewer and we know where she gets her information. Okay. New format to the show this week. We're going to do the 10 teams with the biggest headlines ahead of week four fantasy football. And we'll do the rest of the 22 teams in alphabetical order after that. Just use the timestamps if you get confused. Kick it off with the Los Angeles Chargers. We got to start with the loss of Mike Williams, 26 targets, 249 yards in three games. How are you thinking about how this is going to unfold not necessarily for Keenan Allen, but for Quentin Johnston and Josh Palmer. I think that the Quentin Johnston usage that's been so minimal has been by design because he's quite frankly just not ready. Now, they're desperate, and you can kind of throw all that stuff out of the window because they've been banking on this top four wide receiver. So what Mike Williams brought to this table was downfield passing ability, and I'll pull up a chart in a second. Justin Herbert is throwing the ball more downfield than he had in the year prior. So I think Josh Palmer is going to run a couple more deep routes. I think that Keenan Allen might run a few more deep routes, but we know where he, his bread is buttered. But I think they're going to need Quinta Johnson to spread the field down yeah. deep. And I think they're going to get him some screen looks just because he has some athleticism after the catch. But I think what they need to use is his size and his speed down the field. Even if it's like the Jalen Guyton plus role, like they just need that body in the offense because I don't think Palmer and Keenan Allen necessarily are going to fit that exact mold. My favorite podcast of the week is Zach Kiefer takes over, I guess it's the Tuesday episode of the Athletic Football Show, and he goes around and interviews some beat writers this week. It was with Daniel Popper, uh, who does great work with the Chargers. A quote from him, they really wanted to bring Quentin Johnston along slowly. They loved his skill set, but he was raw. Raw in terms of route running, polish, and physical aspect, but also from a mental standpoint, lining up correctly. Yeah. And now that plan is out the window. So... I'm totally with you. You and I have been talking about Quentin Johnson, who, by the way, I don't think there's a single thing that we can learn from his eight targets this season so far. A couple um, screens and then some kind of body catches. Same old, same old. Same old, same old. But, you know, his analytical profile would have pointed to him being a yards after catch threat because that's where he made work of big 12 corners at, uh, at TCU. But I do think he has a downfield skill set now. Probably he and Josh Palmer are on waiver wires out there. Which one would you prioritize? I think we've seen so much of Josh Palmer that he'll be in the flex kind of category because like this chart showing you the Chargers through the first three weeks are number one team in wide receiver fantasies. There's now a whole lot of that's going to go to Keenan Allen, who I would be viewing as a top five wide receiver for the rest of the way. But I think you have to swing for the fences for Quinton Johnson. You're not going to win your league because of Josh Palmer, most likely. I think there's a chance that Quinton Johnson is way better than we're thinking and that the downfield uh, plays will cash in for Quinton Johnson. I'm just not expecting consistent production from him. But yep. the Chargers and Justin Herbert right now are playing out of their mind passing the ball. So I think that both Palmer and Quinton Johnson are probably going to be rotating weeks. But we need to get Donald Parham out of the red zone on top of this as well. <laughs> but I think moral of the story for me, my biggest takeaway without Mike Williams is I think we can see a stretch run from Keenan Allen. That yeah. could be the best of his entire career. Right now, he's top five in fantasy points and wide receiver. Steve Smith and I just did a show uh, breaking down why Keenan Allen is winning. And to me, it's very sticky. He looks like the same type of headsy player that he's always been. A bit of a change in Mike Williams' usage, which we think is just going to go to Quentin Johnson because, one, Josh Palmer's been in these three wide receiver sets already. So why would he like change his alignment now? 
Um, Mike Williams previously had only been in the slot about 13% of the time. He was 30% through two games this season. And I think that goes in line exactly what you were talking about here with Keenan Allen as he's less of a pure slot player now and being moved around a bit more often. And hey, just going back to you know our, our pre-draft thoughts on Quentin Johnston, we loved when they were allowing him to be a vertical player out of the slot because it gave him runways. It gave him free access. Um, some choice routes or some option routes. Hopefully he makes the right decision. But just getting him on a dead sprint with those long strides and being a vertical playmaker, it might be hot or cold. Mm-hmm. I'm totally with you. I we, we know what we're going to get from Joshua Palmer now. The team obviously loves him. This is why he sat out the entire preseason, was playing well above Quentin Johnson at the start of the season. But again, I don't think what he is doing now is going to change. It's just we hope that as the season goes along, long season, 14 mm-hmm. more games, that Quentin Johnson rounds into a stable player. And that might be a big much. I, final final point, mm-hmm. Daniel Popper on that same podcast said that this is going to hurt Keenan Allen because Mike Williams is doing a bunch of the dirty work in terms of absorbing coverage and concentration from defenses. And that was allowing Keenan Allen to get um, isolated looks. And that might change now. Just a thought. Yeah, I just think that they're scheming up Keenan so much right now with all these screens and his option routes, his ability to press man coverage, beat man coverage right now is unbelievable. Right now, he's number one with 15 receptions against man coverage. The next closest is Michael Pittman at nine. So that's how much uh, tape Keenan Allen's putting on. Just real my last big note here. This is just where Justin Herbert's throwing the ball. Last year is check down city with Austin Eckler. So far without Eckler in the lineup, they've been throwing the ball downfield. Look at these 20 to 50 yards downfield. We have seen more of those. So that's where I need to see Quinton Johnson win. I think Palmer and Quinton Johnson will both be wide receiver three flex types with weekly upside. I think it's going to be very inconsistent how they get there because I don't think either of them are good enough. I think both of them are definitely worth waiver wire consideration just because I trust Kellen Moore to work around Quinton Johnson's weaknesses. Yeah. And I trust Justin Herbert the way that he's playing behind this offensive line to continue slinging the ball. They're like top five in basically every single offensive category right now. I think that's a great point because we have seen Keen Allen miss some games. We have seen Mike Williams miss some games in the past, but this 2023 version of the Chargers underneath Kellen Moore is not the same as those dynamics in those previous years. Okay, one more topic real quick. Joshua Kelly in the absence of Austin Eckler. Um, 13 carries, 39 yards, then 11 carries for 12 yards. Is this kind of just the latest example of we don't know exactly what you get from handcuffs when are, they are thrusted into the starting lineup, which – yeah. One might not be over because Austin Eckler, I believe, has come out and said he's been dealing with a high ankle sprain. Yeah, so it's been pretty impressive what Kelly's been doing. 78 and 74% snaps on an offense putting up this many points. He's getting all the two-minute drills. He's getting all of the goal line usage, but they're just scheming the ball away from him, which I totally get. He's not a difference maker on tape. And the way that Keenan Allen and Justin Herbert are playing, why not keep throwing the ball to them? But right now, Josh Kelly settled in wide receiver, or running back 29 in usage to start the season. His best game was actually the game with Austin Eckler yeah. uh, because the run lanes were wide open, but he's on there on the goal line. So there's still a chance he gets goal line touchdowns and stuff. But to me, it's not a surprise now to see the chargers back at number one or number two in neutral pass rate. Before we go any further, you know, what I'm going to say the 30% of you that watch this channel, specifically stats versus film and subscribe that stick with us through thick and thin our hits and misses. Thank you. You're wonderful people. Your parents raise you correctly. You have tremendous manners. And the 70% of you that do watch, but then just like drift away, you're all right. But you know, you want to be a part of the 30%. So hit that subscribe button and join us for all the fancy content that we have all week long. You don't know ball unless you subscribe. That's that's a fact. Miami Dolphins. So when you survey through three weeks of the NFL season, Raheem Mostert is the running back one overall in fancy points per game, 24.6. And it's pretty miraculous. We rarely see it from just a story arc of a guy like Devon Aching going from a healthy scratch in week one to 47.3 <laughs> fantasy points in week three. Wild stuff, Hayden. Yeah, it's been outrageous, and there's so many stats to get through. I think that the number one stat for me is just, and they're all Mike McDaniel related. They're using motion both in the run game and the pass game at the highest rates in the league. And when you watch Raheem and A Chain play, it's they're doing pitches, they're doing play action underneath looks, they're doing sweeps with these guys, reverses, you name it. 
very rarely is it just running it up the middle. And that's been my issue with a lot of these small running backs is they get used improperly. They fail in that role and then they get pushed to the side. Well, they have so much space to work with because teams are obviously crapping themselves trying to defend Tyreek Hill. But now you have all the speed on the edge and like the way that they're using Devon A chain and Raheem Mostert, they get them on these cutback lanes out in space. And this is how you use these small running backs. So shout out to Mike McDaniel for actually making this thing work. I think that Raheem's going to be the number one guy. I think he's more trusted in the red zone, but they did have a chain down there and they schemed him up twice with the same exact play. And the Broncos were absolutely miserable out here. So you just see how much space is operated. The yards before contact, like you just never see a Dolphins running back get touched behind the line of scrimmage. Instead, I think it was a chain this last week. It was over five yards past the line of scrimmage on the first time he was touched. It's just incredible stuff. Yeah, being able to manufacture five yards of runway for these running backs before they have any contact for any backfield, that would be mm -hmm. amazing. But for guys that are the fastest running backs in the league, it's it's special stuff. And I just go back to the thought that, look, when Mike McDaniel was working with the San Francisco 49ers, obviously Kyle Shanahan's bread and butter is manufacturing passes over the middle of the field. And it sounded like so much of Mike McDaniel's focus was a diverse running game. Mm -hmm. And you see things from this running game that you just don't see throughout the rest of the league. And I'm going to send it to producer Weaves and hopefully put it up at the top of this conversation, just how they are utilizing both motion, as you said, in the running game and in the passing game at full speed. Once the ball is snapped, just way above everyone else. And yeah. it's like CFLizing, arena footballizing football mm -hmm. right now and when you match it with the critical factors of team building of the fastest running backs out there and i'm so glad that we now understand that this is his counterpunch like it's working it's working where hey no jalen waddle and now we just lean heavily on the running game instead of having to pivot on over to braxton barrios or reefer craycraft or Durham Smythe. they hang up 70 points without jalen wall it's just insane um uh, stuff real quick just look at the running back chart that we're talking about you see Devon A. Chain and Raheem Moser both getting worked in. Initially, they both had many goal line opportunities, and they were just running the ball down their throats because the Broncos like very clearly didn't have an answer. So I think for my rankings, Raheem's going to be a top 10 guy. This is yeah. until Jeff Wilson gets back, but we're still murky on that situation. And then I think Devon A. Chain deserves to be ranked ahead of the Samaj P. Ryan. Basically, all the other RB2s, like team RB2s that we rank in fantasy, he's got to be ranked ahead of them because this offense – Right now, it reminds me, like I said in the the recap show, of the Warriors. Like we just have not seen this much speed, RPO, downfield ability, runs to the outside. It reminds me of the three point uh, Warriors and how that really revolutionized the entire N NBA. Totally. And with Jeff Wilson, it seemed like his own representation in Drew Rosenhaus showed more optimism about him returning to the field after you know the pup list when he's yeah. eligible to in Week Five versus what Mike McDaniel said, but. Actually, trying to read Mike McDaniel's words in press conferences when they're just quoted on paper, it, it can be a bit difficult just because of how he speaks. And we absolutely love how he speaks, you yeah. know? Don't change, Mike. It's the best. Never change. I, and your point about where you're ranking Raheem versus Devon Aching, because so often when a guy scores 47 fantasy points, you just assume that he's going to ascend to the running back one status, but having them both as top 30 options, top 36 options is the way to go. Detroit Lions next. Okay, 26 win. We know that. In the absence of Dave Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs, 17 carries, 80 yards, uh, but just one target. And it's interesting how all were utilized. Um, again, 11 targets in the previous two games for Jameer Gibbs when someone like Dave Montgomery was out there on the field. And what stood out to me, Hayden, after six forced missed tackles at a run as a runner in week one, where we saw some of those edge runs and get him out into space, it's been one forced missed tackle in week two and then one forced missed tackle in week three. Um, what did you see? And if we're going to um, potentially acknowledge a change in Jameer Gibbs once DeMont does come back? I think just so clear what each of them bring uh, as positives to this offense. Jameer Gibbs last week had 15 expected half PPR points, even had a goal line opportunity inside the five yard line without David Montgomery, but just didn't get home because he didn't convert for that touchdown. It didn't get used uh, in the receiving game as much as we think. It's just hard because they don't use him in pass protection ever. And like to me on tape, like he just has small legs to me. He's better, way better out in space. That's why we, where he had a bunch of his broken tackles. Uh, they play on Thursday night, big game against the in division Packers. 
David Montgomery is trying to play in that game. I think that they would they missed him in this last game, even though they they were winning by so much the entire game. But I just think that Gibbs is limited in where he's winning right now it's really explosive when he gets going but i do think that they're gonna have to work around his weaknesses right now and i think a lot of it really is, simply is he's just not experienced in the exact offense that the lions are running and his size has been a, a weakness running up the middle and i think more importantly in pass protection i think we can all say that he's super explosive but he's slight and like he bounces off contact um or absorbs it and falls to the ground you know it, I actually think he and A Chain kind of run differently in that regard, despite being of the same size. But that's a conversation for another. I, no, I think I think A Chain runs harder. Like he's more compact because he's not. I don't think he's as as tall as Jameer. So I think that's like the primary difference. But to me, whenever we have that conversation about this, and for a team that builds so many of their explosive plays off deep play action under center. Not many teams do that across the league. That's a mm -hmm. different conversation than we were just having with the Miami Dolphins, right? Deep play action under center is how this Lions team creates their explosives. You're going to have to, in that case, be able to stand up there and pass pro, right? And again, it's why we continue to elevate and value someone like Dave Montgomery. And while it's like a, a role player plus, I honestly would call it right now with, yeah. with Jameer Gibbs. Uh, last week, we did not get an answer between Zon of the Night and Craig Reynolds. They're splitting that dude. I think that just goes to show you that. It like, felt like Zon of the Night to me just from the yeah. eye test and like snaps. Pop a little bit more. Yeah, I, I, I do think Dave Montgomery is going to be back sooner than later. Okay, we got to talk about Sam Laporta because only four tight ends this season have a points per game average of 10 plus and he is one. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are seeing athleticism mixed with Ben Johnson mixed with actual volume and right now, if you have that on your fantasy roster, you are giddy because very few in your league do at the tight end position. Sam Laporta is the tight end three on tight end seven usage, 81% routes last week. It's a good offense, and he looks totally fine with me. He got uh, way deep downfield on a nice schemed up play. He's reliable in zone coverage underneath. They're not subbing him out as much uh, on the ground game either. So he's a, basically a full-time player in an offense that has used tight ends for the last couple of years with Ben Johnson. So uh, he's going to be one of these rookie tight ends, part of the narrative that we're building. That could be a fantasy tight end one. Finally, let's close with Josh Reynolds. Uh, tough run out for him this past weekend. I think he was dealing with an injury heading into the game. Yep. But this is where it gets tough. A guy that very few people drafted. Um, but is on a good offense and in a clear role, opens a season with 10 fancy points, then 21.1 fancy points, and then goose eggs. So then you ask yourself, like, what is reality here? Like, what can I hang my hat on? I would say top 50 wide receiver for now, assuming I would like to see some full practices from Josh Reynolds this week, but also a reminder, use promo code the show and play some best ball on underdog fantasy because you don't have to worry about these dead weeks when you're dealing with these. You just take your round 18 Josh Reynolds and you go home. But I think I'll be ranking him still inside the top 50, but I do think that his route rate went down. It was only at 76% uh, this last week. They were also winning very clearly in this game. So game script got away from them. But I do think the injury probably mattered a little bit as well. Houston Texans. We got to have this conversation about Tank Dell because when he was running as the wide receiver four on his own team, 4.9 fantasy points in week one. Ever since 16.7 and 23. And it's pretty amazing what we're getting out of Tank Dell despite his size, because so often players get pigeonholed because of that. 5'8, 165 pounds, but he's only been in the slot for 21% of his snaps. Mm -hmm. He has an A dot of 12.1 yards. He's an outside and then casually, sometimes an inside player. And Hayden, when I just go back and watch the Tank Dell tape, I struggled to come up with a comparison. Like he's so fluid in his breaks. He gets you on your toes. He has a speed outs. He changes direction in like one single step. He's so much fun to watch. He can ad lib on extended plays too. And the name that popped into my head was John Brown. And apparently it popped mm -hmm. into Matt Harmon's head exactly the same time. A player who in his second season, I think reached a thousand receiving yards. And then he never ascended beyond that. But again, despite being five, eight and one sixty five. Tank Dell is just a whole lot of fun. Yeah, he's running very legit routes, had that big post route, um, and CJ Stroud's been slinging the ball, like you said, on, I think it's on Twitter, him rotating his, his head around on some of these corner routes. 
really going for it right now. They are the uh, fifth ranked team when it comes to wide receiver usage in the entire league. They did it the first two weeks in garbage time this last week out with the lead and CJ Stroud looks so comfortable back there. Really encouraging stuff. And they're just, they're about to get Larry Mutunzel back. One of the top offensive linemen in the entire league, probably this week. And CJ Stroud's playing well ahead of that. I think Slowick is also another one of these young, innovative uh, co coaches coming back from the Shanahan tree that's taking over the league once again this year. I would not keep, I would keep an eye out on the Houston Texans. I think that they're a very legit offense ready to really start exploding because I think that CJ Stroud looks like the best rookie quarterback uh, in the league. In the first two weeks, we saw it just happen like the third and fourth quarters. This past week, we saw it in all four quarters. And there's even room for this to positively regress every commenter's favorite phrase because the Texans right now are last in the NFL in red zone success rate uh, for touchdowns, 27%. Uh, last year, the worst team in the league was at 42%. So even if they stay the worst, that is only going to improve. And I do want to bring up, it's like a smallest little detail, but this looks so simple where obviously Tank Dell is facing towards the outside, expecting the ball to come to his outside shoulder, tracks it. And then how many times, ask yourself this, or next Sunday, pay attention. When you see a wide receiver track a ball, they totally turn their body, they twist, come back facing the ball in order to try to catch it. And then sometimes they stumble, they lose momentum, all of that. Mm -hmm. Tank Dell instead just looks over his opposite shoulder, tracks the football, catches it, and goes long for a touchdown. I asked Colt McCoy about this. He's like, 90% of wide receivers would not play it that way. It's the smallest little detail, but it shows you for a hand-picked player that C.J. Stroud told his front office that you have to get for me. It's working already, and it's working in ways, again, that breaks the mold of these types of frames in the past. Tank Dell, wide receiver 43 in usage to start the season. So he's on the flex radar. A lot of it boom-bust type of usage so far, but we'll take that because he is delivering. Quickly, Damian Pierce did find the end zone. I went back and watched his snaps. His first carry, the line of scrimmage was reset three <laughs> yards in the backfield. It's just not fun. And actually, on Scheme this week with Colt McCoy, we break down that the Jaguars kept just putting – put eight men in the box until CJ Stroud was starting to do this stuff. And that's why we were getting some of those vertical shots. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully just the offensive line blocking just improves. But look again, when the tide raises and when the red zone touchdown rate raises, that is going to be helpful for Damian Pierce. Cause I know he is losing passing down and, and two minute snaps, but that's all he's losing at this point. Yeah, completely agree. I think he, he is a buy low as long as you keep your expectations in check just because he's the RB20 in usage and the red zone stuff I think is strictly an offensive line problem and we should be getting multiple starters back on that offensive line and Devin Singletary is not moving the needle as the backup too. So I think there's a chance that he could absorb a little bit more of the workload. Las Vegas Raiders. So we know that Devontae Adams is good. He's the wide receiver four right now in points per game. The wide receiver six right now is Jacoby Myers, 24.6, missed with a concussion, then 12 half-point PPR points last week. Talk me through it. Well, it's just pretty funny to see how just condensed this offense is. I set like limits on what I'm going to show in the fantasy usage model, and right now there's only three players that have met those <laughs> qualifications. We have Josh Jacobs, who's struggling, Adams and Myers, no tight ends, no Hunter Renfro, no backup running backs, none of that stuff. It's just three these three guys. Devontae Adams still looks like one of the best wide receivers in the league is actually his usage is up this year versus where it was last year. But yeah, Jacoby Myers right now, the wide receiver three in usage. He had, he's had like five red zone opportunities in his two games. And I think that's been the key here. Big uh, th thrust from the referee right there, but you're seeing some schemed up stuff for Jacoby Myers, but a lot of it's in uh, intermediate routes and he looks really good, man. Like his, his physicality uh, certainly sticks out. He's able to work over the middle, which you have to with Jimmy G. That's also why he got that concussion in the first week, but he seems like he's going to have a plan in the red zone, though I will admit some of this stuff has been kind of like scramble drill targets, which might not be as sticky because, you know, they have Devontae Adams to scheme up the ball, but really I think the Raiders' problems offensively is this offensive line has just been struggling. And like Josh Jacobs, it's hard to like break a tackle, for example, when you're hit out at the line of scrimmage because you don't have any momentum at all. So they're, they're whiffing on these duo runs. It's all gap scheme stuff for for the Raiders and they just try to get this one goal line opportunity out there and he gets jammed here. But I think the reason why they didn't even run this up the middle is because their guard play and their center play this year has just not been 
uh, good enough. So Josh Jacobs, the running back 26 yep. on running back seven usage. Um, they just need this offensive line to gel. It's pretty amazing when you think that like everyone returns, the play caller returns. Obviously, you switch quarterbacks, but then we get two wide receivers as top six players at their position. And then, as you said, Josh Jacobs as the running back 26, despite him being the one last year that yeah. carried the offense, totally carried the offense other than the splash plays that we got down the field to Devontae Adams. Um, it just shows you like the math from year to year doesn't exactly work, you know, on, yeah. on bad teams, on bad teams. I think that's easier to say. I will say they're getting really bad run blocking from their tight ends too, which I hopefully that can change as well. Um, but I, I have a feeling prediction here. Josh Jacobs is going to improve and this Jacoby Meyer stuff will regress back to earth. But there's a reason why one thing's working. One thing hasn't been the offensive line has been bad and Jacoby Myers and Devontae Adams that look like really good players. Philadelphia Eagles. So 28 carries for Deandre Swift without Kenneth Gainwell last night with Kenneth Gainwell, 16 carries, Four receptions uh, over the last two weeks for DeAndre Swift. So how now, after more information, how does this unfold for us? It, it seems pretty clear that DeAndre Swift is the more explosive player and the one that this team is going to lean on now. Yeah, they they have Kenny Gainwell in a particular role. They're using him in the two-minute drill. He's getting his own uh, series, too, and they're using him in garbage time. But I'm with you. Like When they want to run the ball north-south, DeAndre Swift is that guy because he 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 has been wide open. You know, like he hasn't had to do a whole lot. I will appreciate that hurdle, of course. But this rushing lane has been enormous for DeAndre Swift. I just don't think that there's a reason to really use Kenny Gainwell aside from kind of a change of pace role because I'm sure that they're looking at DeAndre Swift's injury history and they don't want to like fully unleash him unless it's completely necessary. But right now, DeAndre Swift to start the year is the running back 13 on running back 14 usage. I think this offense being as explosive as it is, and like, I, mean, I mean, look at that. I mean, I'm picking up 18 yards here. Let's be honest. I mean, four or five DeAndre Swift can fit through this. Mm -hmm. um, it does help that he is more explosive than Miles Sanders was last year. Like, that is fair. Mm -hmm. But until we do not get these tush pushes, DeAndre Swift is still probably going to range anywhere from like running back 16 to running back 12. Like, right. We'll get to it in a little bit with some of these running backs. You have to score touchdowns in order to be a top 10 running back on a season. Mm -hmm. And it's it's pretty simple. Um, and we still haven't seen, you know, the pass catching outlet that was not even promised to us, but suggested by many out there uh, that the Philadelphia Eagles are going to add that to their. We're not seeing that. To their play callers, we're not seeing it at all. Um, they're just going to keep doing this, and it's because they can run about three styles of, of running plays and just mash you. It's just meat on meat, and I'm going to move you. Yep. And then for the past game, it's been hit and miss this year. We're getting Jalen Hurts uh, there because of the, of the ground game. Lots of explosives. Uh, A.J. Brown right now is the wide receiver eight in usage. Devontae Smith is the, the wide receiver 47. So it's been a little bit more of a split between those two, though Smitty, we know, got deep uh, just a couple weeks ago. So uh, just something to monitor there. And then Dallas got more involved last week, 8.8 .8 expected fantasy points. But I don't know. He doesn't look as explosive to me just a little bit. And they're not using him just because like they have an explosive ground game. And uh, right now, like what happened last week, the Bucks were just too light in the box. And when you are too light in the box, this Eagles ground game is efficient enough to say, exactly. screw the pass. We will have a consistent ground game. So it's just hard for Dallas Goddard to be like that involved. Dallas Goddard, the tight end 32 in points per game over three weeks. And just to compare this, people on the screen can see it, but for the podcast listeners, Cal Pitts tied in 21, Dalton Kincaid tied in 27, David Njoku tied in 29, Juwan Johnson tied in 38, Chigo Quanquo, the tight end 44. Uh, someone commented the year of the late round tight end got us again. I'll argue it's opposite. paying off. It's the yes. opposite because it's much better than spending a top 12 tight end pick on again the likes of Kyle Pitts or the likes of David Njoku or the likes of Dallas Goddard, so on and so forth, and just take the later round one. And if they miss, then you can just pick up another one. <laughs> the the rookie tight ends, man, Luke Musgrave and Laporta, for example, they look like they have a little something. Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, it really is amazing how three to four bad plays per game mistakes. If you want to call them that not just from the quarterback, from other players too, can change the course of a competitive game to just an outright loss. Mm -hmm. And we're getting that through three games right now 
with the with the Jaguars. Like you have the Calvin really drop bucket touchdown in the first drive. You have a third and two, seven nothing near midfield. Uh, and Trevor and Travis Etienne trip over each other. Then you have a third and ten conversion that you connect with, and then immediately it's fumbled by Jamal Agnew. It's like the fine margins, the inches, as any given Sunday would say. And uh, mm-hmm. right now the Jaguars are off by a couple feet. Yeah, they are tenth in success rate. Um, so on average, they're having good plays, but their actual EPA, they're 28th because the extremes are magnified, especially in the red zone. They can't buy a touchdown. The Calvin Ridley drop was super tilting right now. Ridley's leading the NFL with four drops. He's the wide receiver 40 on wide receiver 17 usage. Um, yeah, it's just been sloppy little mistakes. And it's like, I don't even know who to blame here necessarily. Like it, to me, it seems decently schemed up properly. The offensive line had a really bad game the previous week. Trevor Lawrence is barely missed on some throws, but I think a lot of it has just been the skill guys, not even necessarily Trevor Lawrence here. So this does feel, I know we said this exact same thing after week two. To me, this does feel like an offense that will just get into gear all of a sudden, yes. but we really just need Calvin really to catch the ball, the offensive line to have a couple fewer penalties. And then the short yardage stuff with Travis Etienne, it's always just something new. Like this last game, like you said, if trip over each other, another game, it's a blown block. It's a bad vision. It's a fumble here and there. It's just, everything's kind of compounded by, I think ultimately we'll look back from the first couple of weeks and be like, ah, yeah, the Jaguars are a top 10 offense. Are we to the point though, that this team is over the last two years, so frustrated with that for whatever reason, lack of short yard success from Travis Etienne that like, Hey, if we're getting inside the five yard line, tank Bigsby, it's, it's all you. Well, that's what happened last week. We had Travis Etienne played 30 of the first 33 snaps, and then once they get to the goal line, in comes Tank Bigsby. So it's something to monitor. It would not be surprising if that's what the usage is, and I would just call that fancy James Cook. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been it's been an issue for Travis Etienne. Right now, he's the, the running back 21 in usage because he's playing on passing downs, but they're not scheming him up passing down uh, opportunities. And then the ground game, it's the least valuable touches in the league. Now, next week we can be breaking down a hurdles 80 yard touchdown, of course. Totally. Um, so he'll still be an RB2, but like the RB1 upside seems kind of hard to envision. It's a trend right now, you know, of hey, these guys are super explosive. They get us inside the 10 yard line. And whether it be rookies or, you know, veterans that have lost a step, now they come in to be inside the five and inside the 10 yard line players like teams are adding these and prioritizing them throughout the league. I feel like more now than we ever have in the past. I wonder if it's because the position is cheaper and it's like easier to find a tank Bigsby like round three, round four now, because maybe they would have been RB or round two players. Yeah. You know, I mean, you need to have multiple players at the position and between the twenties, I think teams want to be more explosive than they ever have been before in between the tens. Let's put it that way. But maybe with those body types and with those styles, those players just aren't as successful in the short yardage. So right. as we used to see it with, you know, 15 play drives, grinding it out with Steven Davis and so on and so forth. Why not just have your own, you know, Steven Davis inside the five yard? You have no clue who I'm talking about. No, of course not. I was playing, you wore number, I was playing with a ball. He wore number 48 as a running back. He was sick. Okay. Seattle Seahawks. JSN is being left behind in this offense a little bit. Now, granted, we have a buy coming up for this team in week five, but we're having really solid starts of the season for DK Metcalf, for Tyler Lockett, even for Kenneth Walker. I'm a bit nervous of when it is going to turn around for Jackson Smith and Jigba because right now this team is in 11 personnel just 56% of the time. I believe that is 21st in mm-hmm. the league. There are 10th highest in 12 personnel. They're 6th highest in 13 personnel. I don't know if JSN has convinced them enough to change their ways versus the personnel groupings that they were successful with last season. And it also doesn't help that the two tackles have been hurt. So more tight ends just helps with blocking. Yeah, I completely agree. And then Kenneth Walker is running his ass off too. Still yeah. my favorite. So I think he's my favorite running back to watch in the league. Not the best running back. But my favorite chaos running back is Kenneth Walker and it's paying off for him. But yeah, JSN, he's averaging under 10 air yards per game. You know, like that's less than Kadarius Tony, for example. So it's just been an issue for him seeing the field. And then when he, even when he is on the field, it's just the underneath stuff. And that's just hard to make a living on, especially when you have Metcalf and Lockett, who obviously are going to be the first and second read on every single red zone opportunity. So uh, 
I think that the offense is being schemed around the offensive tackle play and they're getting the most out of it. But I do think that takes a little bit of the gump from this offense. And I do think that the one that's going to absorb most of it right now is Kenneth Walker because he's just been so reliably efficient yeah. right now. Yeah. Just a word on Shane Waldron plus Kenneth Walker, because this combination is really fun to see how creative they've been with it. Um, this first play out of, again, two tight ends in the backfield. Um, this is in week one, the first play of week one. And the gain doesn't go for much. It's off the left side, follows his blockers, so on and so forth. And then all the way in week three, which I think after seeing what Mike McDaniel's doing in Miami with these little short speed motions, Kenneth Walker, again, somewhat of the same look with two fullback slash tight ends. They send Kenneth Walker on like this, the smallest yo-yo motion you've ever seen in your life, but it gets him up to full speed. And then he's following both of his tight ends, plus mm -hmm. some offensive linemen getting out there. They seal the crease and he gets up the field. I'd love this different usage. And then the same game after already showing that same running back motion. Now we get it with Kenneth Walker on the end around motion. And look at all the eyeballs. Look at Brian Burns flying up the field. And that allows for Zach Charbonnet to reel off like a 14 yard gain. I mean, we see wide receiver motion and usage and that type of stuff. And it's cool to see Shane Waldron in mm -hmm. Seattle doing it with his backs as well. I think the biggest tell right now for how good of an offensive coordinator you are is, is your motion for show where you're not actually getting up to speed or you, or is your motion to actually get your best players at full speed when the ball is snapped? And that was a good example. And I think a credit to the Seahawks staying alive despite two crucial injuries. Carolina Panthers. Somehow we have three Panthers films to show. Uh, the first one, let's open it with because Adam of you. <laughs> let's open it with Adam Thielen because that first week he was not right. Three catches. Since he's had eight catches and eleven catches. Adam Thielen right now is the wide receiver twelve in points per game. Is this going to last? Uh, of course not. Um, he's the wide receiver 43 in yards per route run, but he has been a useful underneath target. And I think as long as Andy Dalton is starting, I think I'll have a decent ranking on him because Andy Dalton played one hell of a game. Uh, this first play is out of control. The hit he takes yeah. to throw this ball out there. I mean, credit where it's due. Andy Dalton has played a really good game last week, got Adam Thielen involved. So yeah, I think this was probably the best game what we'll see from Adam Thielen. I will say they're using him in the slot where you can kind of just sit down and, and curl around. And th that's the best use out of him. You're going to see this type of stuff in the red zone in particular if they can actually get down there. But um, I, I think that it's going to be tough sledding for the, the Panthers offense as a whole this year still. Also a word for Miles Sanders. I think this is one of those cases where we're taking one battle at a time and you and I love press conferences. You and I love coach speak. And one of the main ones was after giving so much money to Miles Sanders is we were going to use him as a pass catcher. Many people presented his lackluster passing down performances over the last years of the Philadelphia Eagles. But right now, Miles Sanders leads all running backs with 18 targets in the NFL. He is on pace for over 100 targets so far this week against Seattle. And you pointed this out, Hayden. You suggested it, that without wide receivers that can separate, Miles Sanders is going to be a featured player. Now, you didn't suggest it might be as a wide receiver where you lined up out wide nine snaps. But on those nine snaps, he was fed the ball five times, five targets on those. I'm not saying that this is great usage in terms of it's going to win football games for the Carolina Panthers, but we don't get this type of stuff with many running backs throughout the league. Right now, Miles Sanders is the running back 17 on, on running back eight overall usage. Um, so I'll, I'll say this. I think both both parties were right here. Miles Sanders has been extremely inefficient on them, totally. but they have to use him out of necessity too. And I, when I was like just starting fantasy stuff, the first thing that stuck out is like the Tom Brady seasons when the running backs were getting peppered with targets. Those were also the seasons where they didn't have that much wide receiver talent. So I think it's just like if the wide receivers are good, no running back gets involved. If the wide receivers are bad, then you have to check the ball down. We've seen that on the opposite end with the Eagles, for example. Um, I also think that Bryce, when he does come back, he's going to continue checking the ball down just because uh, they, they need it. So I think Miles Sanders will backdoor his way into like the running back 13 or 14. They just need the Panthers to improve as the season goes on. Cleveland Browns closes out our top 10 here. No doubt in my mind, Jerome Ford stays as this team's lead running back. It's what yes. we saw in his first game as he starter after Nick Chubb went down, right? 
Yeah, I thought he looked very explosive. A couple of nice cutbacks in this game. I think that Kareem Hunt was a, a free agent for a reason, and Jerome Ford had 11.3 expected fantasy points without Nick Chubb. He's the running back three in yards after contact per carry in the NFL right now. So impressive stuff for Jerome Ford. He looks the part to me. I think they can use him in each phase. Uh, my other only note for the Browns here is when they are dropping – back to pass Deshaun Watson's throwing the ball downfield. Like right now, for example, Amari Cooper's the wide receiver five in air yards per game. They're scheming up some stuff for Elijah Moore, which I do think is probably one of the reasons why David and Joku isn't performing that much. But I do think that these shot passes to Amari Cooper will be something that the Browns offense uh, will be happy to have as the season progresses, weather permitting. This sluggo touchdown that Jerome Ford got hit on, just like the way he moves it and tracks the ball, um, it made me think that he has some like wide receiver background to him. And I went back and looked at his high school stats. Uh, as a senior in high school, he caught 42 passes for 800 yards and eight touchdowns, which is, you know, coming out of school, he didn't have that much receiving work at Cincinnati. He was going to be projected into this receiving back usage this year, the 160 opportunities that Kareem Hunt got. And it makes sense when you're comfortable in that area. Uh, speaking of, Elijah Moore so far, 23 targets through three weeks, six carries. He's seen 22 snaps in the backfield. You can tell that he's like Kevin Stefanski's new toy, that they use mm -hmm. him in a bunch of different ways. But is it in ways that are going to equal fantastic fancy points for us probably somewhere in the middle um he's the wide receiver 52 on wide receiver 30 usage those are both above 10 expected fantasy points in the two games without chubb because he is going to get involved in the ground game it does seem like every single nfl offense now um especially if you're in that coaching tree has to have 180 <laughs> pound wide receiver that's used all over the field and honestly i love it because we need more of these body types in the league it makes more fun i'm just not sure if this offense is going to be like that electric just because of Sean Watson so far has been hit and miss a better game here, which yeah. has me encouraged, but I think that he's going to maintain in the flex rider because of Mark Cooper, man, like his film, like he drew a bunch of defensive pass interference. He's one of my favorite wide receivers in the league just because he's so physical on the perimeter. And it's all like the most difficult routes to run. He has a little bit of finesse still, but he's just like one of these throwback wide receivers that's playing still at the top of his game. Time for alphabetical order, Arizona Cardinals. 16.6, 17.6 fantasy points for James Conner over the last two weeks. He's the running back eight overall. He might be the biggest workhorse in the NFL if your name isn't Zach Moss and Kyron Williams. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. When they have a lead, which is going to be hard to predict here, James Conner is going to be heavily involved. He has at least 11.9 expected half PPR points in all three of his games, which has led to him being the running back nine on a running back 11 usage that's fun stuff not playing all the passing down so i think that is like the little bit of a difference between last year but the good news for this offense is they phased zach Ertz out of it 62 percent so we can forget that the zach Ertz usage from the first two weeks but what was impressive to me is the marquis brown stuff down down the field they're scheming up just a, a little bit but it was a good reminder of like how effective of a wide receiver marquis brown actually is down the field like he's a small guy but he can win like in the traditional ways as well so that was a hell of a catch here this good opportunity working across the field um so shout out to the cardinals i will say just watching them it's like kind of like a you can just tell that they play really hard and like yep. what was really impressive and we'll get to this when we could talk about the cowboys is in the secondary they're passing everything off like it's just a well co coached put together team they are lacking talent like legitimately everywhere so that will be the storyline for the cardinals for the entire year but you can tell that this coaching staff is really pulling this thing out so marquise brown wide receiver 31 in usage and i think that dobbs and this coaching staff is going to do just enough for him even though this offense will be inconsistent to kind of hang around the wide receiver three flex radar yeah 14.4 14.6 fantasy points for marquise brown over the last two weeks just quickly on drew petzing the offensive coordinator um they had two back-to-back -back plays in 01 and 02 personnel with rondell moore so that means no running backs on the field. And so when a defensive coordinator in the booth sees that or on the sideline, hey, we got to get in dime personnel. Mm -hmm. But then they utilize Rondell Moore in the backfield. One was a carry, which they almost condensed the formation a little bit. And the second one, they did trips right, one solo guy on the left, and just did a simple zone read, six versus six. 
And in that case, if the linebacker doesn't scrape over, then it's just Rondell Moore off the races for everyone else. So it was like two very simple play calls back to back, but the creativity came in the personnel groupings. Let's now go to the Atlanta Falcons. I think last week shows that it's very difficult for defenses to shut down the likes of Bijan Robinson and Tyler Algier. But when they do, the Falcons right now don't have a counterpunch because yeah. everyone asked for Desmond Ritter to throw more. And when he gets 38 passing attempts, this is still what you get. And it's very clear that Arthur Smith isn't going to allow Ritter to throw 35 plus times unless he has to. And even if he has to, the results can still be awful. Yeah, he's just not good enough. Like I, I don't know, know what to say. He's in, he's inaccurate. I think he plays relatively small. The Falcons are 31st in neutral pass rate, only uh, ahead of the Jets. Who, speaking of terrified of their quarterback, that's what New York is. So, un- it's basically Pitts and Drake London have to make superstar plays. They're both capable of doing it. To me, Drake London looks better than Kyle Pitts. I will say every yes. single like per snap per route metric looks really strong for Kyle Pitts but they just don't matter when the results are limited in volume. And then like on that play, just overthrows. But I will say Kyle Pitts does not look like he's striding out as normal, uh, which is also crazy because he's still running past everybody, even right. though he has that weird gate just shows how good he is, but it's just like not the same right now. Yeah. Look at this. And again, as you said, he's still separating, he's still getting open, but you can't tell me that this is a full stride here from Kyle right. Pitts and that he is 100%. Now, does that mean he's going to be 100% in five weeks? I have no clue, but he does not have the gate right now to be this elite athlete that it was banked on that he was going to be. Uh, Ryan McChrystal pointed this out. Cal Pitts has finished as a top eight fantasy tight end five times in his career. Sam Laporta has already done that three times in the first three weeks of the season. So like, I don't know, man. I, I You know this. I think it's over for Cal Pitts this season. Like, it's just over. I will say because the position is so bad everywhere around him, he is the tight end eight in usage so far, but like that's super but, and the nice. tight end 21 in fantasy points per game. Like yeah. it really is where the routes are coming down to. Then it always is going to boost him in this, but mm-hmm. it's just not, it's just not it. Right. My now. model does not, has not watched Desmond Ritter play football. I will <laughs> acknowledge that Baltimore Ravens. I really hated the Zay flowers usage last week. Like absolutely hated it. It felt like the entire Ravens offense was, trying to get it going and they just couldn't. Mm -hmm. But despite all that, it was just stick route after stick route, going to run three or four steps on the field, then just turn around. The ball's on me. The defensive back's on my back. And I'm just going to try to turn around and make a play happen. I need more intermediate routes from Zay Flowers in order for him to have a legit wide receiver ceiling and not just be this volume sponge. And I will say, I think on for my tape evaluation on Zay, that was my big concern. Like he can make a splash play downfield because he plays bigger than his size, but ultimately running the intermediate routes is going to be a little bit more difficult for him because he was used so much underneath and so much downfield less. So between that. And I, I watched the press uh, man coverage routes for Bateman and Nelson. And it's just like, they're not getting enough out of those two. So Lamar Jackson is still capable of making a big play, but they still do have a little bit of the same issue since they've traded away Marquise Brown. That like, consistent downfield guy they are just still missing i don't think that we can just assume that zay flowers will be that guy there's a chance he is but that is not how they're using him like you mentioned buffalo bills should we open this with dalton and kate um this is turning into a long tight end conversation this week Mm -hmm. but he only had two targets this past week he's had 12 on the season he's the same a dot as rondell moore there is nothing creative or mismatchy with his usage so far this team already is running 12 personnel 55 percent of the time 11 personnel 40 percent of the time just these things that were suggested or promised about how don kincaid is going to transform this offense it is not happening through three weeks of the season yeah tight end 17 in routes even though the bills are number two or number three in neutral pass rate and when he is running the routes so much of it's just like chip and release out in the flats, a little screen, like a, trying to get a little something on a leak route. So like they're trying, but trying underneath to use his yards after the catch ability. And you want to see the usage similar like Luke Musgrave, where if he is hitting, it's at least hitting 15, 20 yards right. or further downfield. We have not seen that yet. Four yards uh, is his average depth of target. He's the tight end 27 in usage actually behind Dawson Knox, who was a near full-time player, 72% of the snaps 
playing through that back injury. I don't see why this would change. Really, this offense, it's more dink and dunk than it has been previously because they are throwing the ball to Kincaid like this. They are throwing the ball to James Cook a little bit more than they had previously. So someone like Gabe Davis, it's going to be super inconsistent as usual. But to me, this Bills offense is going to be very sweet this entire year. It just might be pretty spread out. Right, and it's already successful, so I don't see why it would change necessarily. Again, it's a very long season, but this is not gold standard usage that transforms the the tight end position. Uh, on James Cook, he's the running back 14. He's had 8.3, 17.9, and 12.2. If you didn't know his fantasy points and only watched him week to week, you would think he's this super explosive back, which he really is, and creating these chunk gains of like 10 to 12 to 17 yards. But really, I think his final runs were like a perfect encapsulation for this. He breaks it 36 yards from the 38-yard line to the two-yard line. Latavius Murray instantly comes in, fails. James Cook comes back in, fails. And they bring back Latavius Murray in for the touchdown. Like, like running back 12 is great, but it's not going to be a top 10 running back without touchdowns this season. It's really that simple. Yeah, I, th I still think you're pretty happy if you drafted James totally. Cook. But I think that the limitations that we talked about are coming true here. So I, I will say James Cook's explosiveness between the 20s is still a big answer to what the Bills yes. had been struggling with in previous seasons. To, the ability just to run out of uh, two high shells is going to help them out. And they don't really need James Cook to be a bruiser inside the goal line because they have Latavius Murray is just going to take what's blocking. And then obviously Josh Allen, when push comes to shove, will be pushing and shoving. I think it's an interesting conversation of like, hey, would you rather have James Cook or James Conner? Like James Conner who owns everything but is on like probably a bad team versus James Cook who creates these explosive between yeah. the 10s. But if the ball's inside the 10-yard line, he's almost certainly not going to get the touchdown. I would rely on the good player on the good team even if it doesn't right. give me you know, the, the upside of top five, top seven potential because yeah. – you know, I, I think the Cardinals offense, and that's more of just like an example of a bigger point, if I'm making, mm -hmm. don't come at me, Cardinals fans, mm -hmm. of um, a team like that could probably bottom out more likely than the Bills. Yeah, I think it's totally fair. They're both like RB2s for me. Yeah. Chicago Bears. Oh, boy. Yeah, what do you want to say? Take it away. I mean, I have nothing to say. Like, what, <laughs> what can I possibly say? Uh, here, I'll, I'll throw a stat out for you, though. DJ Moore in 2020, his expected half PPR points with the Carolina Panthers was at 10.0 across the season. With the Bears, it's at 6.7. So we have our quarterback tier show coming out on Thursday. They're facing the Denver Broncos. We saw what the Broncos defense just allowed. I mean, the ultimate, purely for fantasy football, but the ultimate make or break week for a player ever is Justin Fields this week versus the Denver Broncos defense. Here's the challenge. And they did it last week to, to their credit. It's 10 design rush attempts for fields because the Broncos did not want to tackle anybody last week. Like just point blank period. They did not want to tackle anybody. Justin Fields. Congrats. You're running the ball 15 times next week or we riot. Cincinnati Bengals played on Monday night. Got it going a little bit. It's so clear that Joe Burrow isn't even close to yeah. being fully healthy, but because of that health, they changed the usage a little bit. For Jamar Chase, 22 slot snaps for Jamar Chase last night was the most he's seen since week one of the 2022 season, a 30% slot snap rate through three games after just 21.7% slot snap rate last season. Yeah, it, it was very effective. He still got Jamar Chase working downfield just a little bit, nothing like too crazy. Um, but I think the reason why they put him in the slot is because Joe Burrow, like simply put, like can't throw it with the same mustard to the sideline. So and they don't want him taking hits or be scrambling or buying time to set up those downfield throws. So just like, okay, let's just play the quick game, which Joe Burrow is excellent at, and throw the ball to Jamar Chase. Really easy stuff for him. So that's encouraging for his floor. I will say, though, it's still like this issue of the calf injury. Like mm -hmm. we've seen this with other quarterbacks. I think this like just doesn't get that much better for long mm -hmm. periods of time. Um, so I think that. Jamar Chase and T Higgins are probably gonna have to trade off big weeks. And actually, even though T Higgins has been like very good uh, at times this year, I'm actually a little bit more worried about him because I think that if they're going to pick one guy to get scheme up and put in the slot and stuff, like we saw this last week, it's like very clearly Jamar Chase. He's just like a better player for that role. Yeah, I think that's extremely well put. How the offense is orchestrated right now, we have to reset our priors and believing that, hey, this is one that can 
prop up two wide receivers on on a weekly basis, which like now the Houston Texans offense can prop up two wide receivers on a weekly basis, you know? I will say the counter to my my own point here, the Bengals are now number one wow. in neutral pass rate. So they've given up on the ground game. I wonder if it's Burrow's just more comfortable instead of like turning his back and like doing the under center stuff uh, because of his calf injury. But Joe Mixon, he will still have some good games found the end zone. Uh, goal line roll plus 57% routes. Like that's more than enough for Joe Mixon to get there. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's just dink and dunk, dink and dunk for the next couple weeks. Dallas Cowboys. The two players that we really want to hit, C.D. Lamb, Tony Pollard, are still hitting. And there's room to grow for this Cowboys offense. Like, obviously, last week against the Cardinals did not go well. But they're right now 27th in red zone TD success rate after being first last season. I watch this game because I'm trying to figure out what the hell is going on here. Um, first of all, just to explain my chart, like the Cowboys, what is going on? 33.7 wow. expected fancy points to the running backs. Obviously, most of that is with Tony Pollard, way above even second place uh, in the league. It was frustrating to see how much they ran the ball last week. They were Did McCarthy forget that they were losing? Like It was just like run, run, pass, run, run, pass, even though they were losing in the second half and they were missing three very 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 good offensive linemen we'll see if they are going to be back this week they're not injured reserve guys they were just ruled out uh or they just weren't straight up playing so i think that was ultimately the issue dak prescott uh look, made a couple plays there was a lot of penalties in this game it was just like a very sloppy like like cowboys first take sloppiness penalties offensive line issues all of that stuff was playing into this one um but they can't just do the regular under center uh, stuff in the red zone with backups uh that i think was like the primary issue yeah and you know i said that about cd lamb but in two of his three weeks he does have fewer than 10 fantasy points um it's gonna work out it's gonna work out i, I it's so funny when you look at these like epa charts that also include pass protection or like passing grades by mm -hmm. pff and it's like hey when the offensive line plays well then there's good epa by the quarterback right. and then when it doesn't then they're both down here at the exact same time maybe there's a connection between the two i would say so um i will say another tape take uh tape dog take from your boy michael gallup had the best game he's had oh. in a very long time was drawing defensive pass interferences working underneath had some vintage downfield stuff from michael Gallup. i've not seen a move like that in a long time Brandon Cooks and Gallup will be obviously rotating. Didn't matter for fantasy purposes necessarily, but Michael Gallup to me at least looked like somebody that had a little bit of a uh, pop uh, on his tape. Denver Broncos are up next. Everyone is searching for like the next rookie breakout and on just 22% of snaps, Marvin Mims is breaking out where he can. I think he's kind of in a similar situation to what Jackson Smith and Jigba is in right now where the team just isn't running 11 personnel at an average rate across the league. They are like 23rd in it at the moment. Um, we know how much Sean Payton loves his tight ends. We know how much Sean Payton wants to rely on the running game right now, probably because of his lack of his trust in Russell Wilson. Even though Russ had his moments, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't see how, unless a trade happens or an injury happens, Marvin Mims cracks those two wide receiver sets. And right now, again... They're not living in a three wide receiver set world. Yeah, they're not in 47% neutral pass rate as well. Bottom 10 in the NFL. So when you're watching Mims, he moves like a freak, man. Like you see it on special teams. You see it on all these post routes, go routes that you're seeing from Mims. But it also, if you like look at the inverse of that, nothing intermediate, yep. nothing schemed up. It's or It is schemed up, but it's schemed up way down the field, which is playing to Russ's strengths. But I think it does go to the limitations Mims has in his game just coming out of college. I think it'll take more than just this year to get through with that. Um, so better in best ball pick for sure. But I think the playing time, the consistency of the offense, and then his own skill set will work against him from being like a, a legit fantasy asset. To your point, zero to nine yards down the field. He has four routes. 10 to 19 yards on the field. Zero routes. 20 plus yards on the field five routes yeah. so literally it's either short deep nothing in between mm -hmm. nothing in between okay not a surprise no 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 this is his game is vertical ball tracking at this moment and maybe it can expand from there green bay packers we can go a few different ways here one 
we have spoken about after watching AJ Dillon fill in for Aaron Jones that he was running in a puddle of mud. Um, I think Patrick Taylor saw just six fewer snaps than AJ Dillon this past weekend. And I'm just amped to watch Christian Watson when he gets back. And it might happen this Thursday. As Graham Barfield pointed out, Jordan Love ranked first right now in average depth of target down the field at 10.2 yards, third in deep throw rate, where 17% of his reps are 20 plus yards down the field. Mm -hmm. And then on throws of 10 plus air yards, uh, he is the 10th best in catchable rate this season. And we know that Christian Watson, other than getting some great manufactured touches near the line of scrimmage was awesome on those vertical shots last year too. Yeah. I think all three of the wide receivers complement each other fairly well. You're still getting a bunch of schemed up stuff from Jaden Reed, uh, Jaden Reed, a third of his targets has been in the red zone. We can't expect that to continue on, especially when Watson comes back. Romeo Dobbs really physical, uh, was once again, physical in this game, but I, I am with you. There, there is room for some shot plays, uh, unfortunately, Jordan Love is taking them and missing them to my boy, Luke Musgrave, who is wide open <laughs> down the seam again, driving me crazy. We are this close from Luke Musgrave being the tight end one by a mile in yeah. fantasy. Uh, but those those will uh, regress positively, positively for Luke Musgrave. He's already the tight end 14 in usage. His ADOT's over 11 yards downfield, and he's running around an 82% of the drop back. So this, this offense feels very close for being like, very watchable with a bunch of players oh, yeah. that are like 25 years or younger. Yeah. And they did some really cool stuff out of empty in this game. It was really a, a kickstart for them. And then once the saints are sending pressure in some of those, then they would bring in AJ Dillon or Patrick Taylor to pass pro. And then again, you get these one-on-one -on -one shots and the wide receivers that like weren't making the plays in the third quarter started making them in the fourth quarter. And I know you're like half joking with the loose Luke Musgrave stuff, but Again, going through that entire list of the six names that everyone drafted and are probably still starting at their tight end position, someone might be on the lookout to drop Luke Musgrave at this point because his production hasn't matched the expected fantasy points. I think his upside is better than so many of the names that we have talked about, the veterans that were drafted well ahead of him. So he's definitely worth yeah. a shout in those leagues if that happens. I still think he caught like six passes last week. So we will take the production as is, but no one's being used downfield as much as Luke. Indianapolis Colts talk me through this insane Zach Moss usage, because all I can think about is with how quickly Shane Sykin is calling plays, even with Gardner Minshew at quarterback, we could get like a legendary season from Jonathan Taylor. If he ever puts back on an Indianapolis Colts uniform, it'd be nice if we got any news from Jonathan Taylor. Mm -hmm. Like we, we legitimately haven't gotten anything. So I, I don't know what the read is on that situation. Uh, in the short term, we'll have Zach Moss, who's losing a couple snaps to my boy, Trey Sermon. But what's cool about Zach Moss is he's just like so short and stocky that he could be utilized everywhere. He has like soft hands, uh, nothing too electric about his profile, except that he can absorb usage and the usage works in like the percentage of his snaps. But like you said, the Colts offense is like actually fun to watch. Well, coach pace, they'll get him going on stuff like this. So you're seeing a little bit of everything from Zach Moss right now who through the first three weeks is the running back four on running back five usage. It's just hard to rank him very low right now when he's playing legitimately like 90% of the snaps. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty amazing. He does a lot of things. Well, nothing extraordinary, but he's solid in a number of areas and it helps that that environment is running a lot of plays and a solid, blocking unit and that he's in there for every single snap. Um, let's also talk about Michael Pittman and Josh Downs. Yes. Lay it out for me. I think Michael Pittman's one of the most underrated, like real wide receivers in the league. I don't try telling the people. I don't see many negative traits on his profile at all. And then you watch the tape and all of a sudden Josh Downs is starting to make some plays. Now the way that Michael Pittman's making his plays like this one Tough. is real wide receiver stuff. Mm -hmm. And then like the Josh down stuff, you're seeing whip routes, you're seeing some schemed up stuff underneath, but it is a nice compliment to uh, these players. And obviously not going to get anything from Alec Pierce, as we've mentioned before. Uh, but Josh downs at least is the wide receiver 37 in usage because they're playing with enough pace. Uh, I just don't like slot only wide receivers and kind of middling offenses, but they're at least playing with enough volume. But in the meantime, man, Michael Pittman winning underneath, uh, intermediate and down the field. 
Yeah, he's the wide receiver 13 right now. 19.7, 9.6, 12.2 fantasy points. And their A dots on paper are similar. You know, Josh Downs has a 5.1 A dot, Michael Pittman a 5.5. But I think some of that is masked by, you know, that screen that we got from Michael yes. Pittman that he took to the house. Uh, when Gardner Minshew is in there, the A dot is even lower. And actually, what we've seen from Anthony Richardson, if you go and sort by intended air yards per attempt, he's the lowest in the NFL right now. Yeah. But I think this all expands when he does come back and as the season goes along. Shane Steichen's so good at his job. Mm -hmm. They're hanging in there in that division right now. Just something to monitor. He's so good at his job. Okay, Kansas City Chiefs are up next. I have a name that I want to talk about here, but not until a little bit later on. Like, this Chiefs team, it... It feels like we can talk about like 12 different players or just like two in Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. You know what I mean? Like we can talk about all the others, but like, does it matter? Well, remember when I was talking about the Raiders, there's only three people that made right. the threshold on the Chiefs. Now you can see there's like 12 of them. So I, let me guess, was it the player you want to talk about? Was it Rasheed Rice? It is. It's Gosh. Rasheed Rice. Now, but I, I, I want to separate this because it's very easy in a blowout to look at Rasheed Rice and say that, oh, he played 53% of the snaps. He got seven targets. They're going to try to incorporate him a bit more. And that's possible. But he only saw two targets before the score was 24 to nothing and then five targets after that. Yeah. Again, you can take that and say that, okay, Rasheed Rice has some warts in his game and maybe they're trying to iron them out and smooth them out a little bit. But until that happens, Hayden, we also are not seeing another wide receiver step up. Now, you and I are both on record saying none of these wide receivers are going to step up, that it's just a bunch of dudes, horses for courses, and we go from there. But if I had to make a bold prediction, if one does, I think it might be Rasheed Rice. Yeah, all five of the wide receivers that get looks are all outside the top 50 in points and usage to start the season. It's just they kind of just like rotate them out and they're so defined right. in their roles. So it's going to be very hard to make that happen. Uh, my only note on rice was that three of his targets came from Blaine Gabbert, which that goes into the garbage time stuff that we're talking about. Um, Kadarius Tony played two snaps while working through that foot injury. We need full practices from Kadarius Tony. Uh, and even when we do get full practices, we get part-time routes. Uh, so yeah, I mean, ultimately it's like, could we get something from Isaiah Pacheco or Jarek McKinnon? Like, well, you get you get end zone touchdowns. You get red zone touchdowns out of that grouping right now. But it's impossible to like predict them. You know, like right. that's that's the hard part with Jarek McKinnon, Pacheco, Ch. So like, you're just praying for the touchdowns, and they use literally all twelve players in the red area. So you're like, I mean, <laughs> what are we even doing here? L.A. Rams. Uh, we kept repeating it last week, but do not let Puka Nakua's start and a magnificent one overshadow Tutu Atwell's role in this offense because it's really clear that Sean McVay loves scheming up stuff for Tutu Atwell. It's just those short motions at some level of speed, gives him a free release, and he's attacking different areas than Puka is. And they're both startable each week, 100%. Yeah, Puka and Akua, even like a down week, still had 21% of the targets and that was by far Matthew Stafford's worst game under a lot of pressure. I think that Hill rebound and then two, two, like you said, just so schemed up uh, wide receiver 15 in both points and usage to start the season. We're getting closer to Cooper cup in theory. I do think that they miss his explosiveness on this option routes. Puka Nakua sits down in zone coverage. We have a great episode on scheme. I like Puka's tape, but is limited in like his ability to create after the catch where Cooper cup can do that. And then once again, Kyron Williams, 100% of the snaps, 18.1 expected fantasy points. He is the core, uh, the current running back two in usage. He just didn't wow. pay off last week because the Rams couldn't move the ball. Yeah. Kyron Williams right now is the running back six overall in half point PPR fantasy points, 17.4, 25, and 7.5. And like the usage was there even more than that, as you said, because a lot of those passes were flying over his head a little bit. I, mean, I just have to show, show this chart. Rams second in wide receiver fantasy usage. So when Cooper Cup gets back, there is opportunity for all these guys to stay relative uh, in fantasy land. Minnesota Vikings, our weekly Jordan Addison conversation. Uh, he did run a route on 80% of dropbacks. It was his first game without a touchdown so far this year. That still gave us eight targets, six receptions for 52 yards. I sense like a little bit of lack of excitement from you, though. Yeah, because it's still KJ Osborne running 
all the two wide receiver set snaps over Addison. So the 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 routes were up, but like marginally. Addison still is the wide receiver 25 on wide receiver 44 usage, which is incredible. And like we said in the freaking off season last year, Adam Thielen was second in routes run. Do you know who's number one? It's Justin Jefferson this year. Number two, KJ Osborne. Like, can we just get these guys flipped? You're zero and three. Let's see something from happen. this rookie. I, it's, it's coming very soon, but it's, it's, it is impressive that Addison got there on spike weeks, like big plays down the field. This last week, a lot harder on him, a lot more in breaking, uh, out breaking routes, a lot more jam coverage on him. And he was still able to get some defense pass interference called on him and created some separation intermediate. So big days are coming for Jordan Addison. Just I was hoping after that post by mini riot by bump that we'd get a little bit more usage and we just didn't get it. I'm very aware of what could potentially happen this week with the Vikings backfield. Um, look, I am farthest from a cam Akers fan and i understand Alexander madison on paper put out 125 yards but if you go and watch it it's about the most lackluster 125 yards yeah. plus some mistakes that were wiped away um uh, he's a running back 22 right now despite owning this backfield and at some point something has to give unless they are just perfectly happy with getting 3.6 yards per touch He's averaging seven half PPR points fewer than what an average running back would wow. have with his usage, which, by the way, it's the RB4 usage. Now, I think what's going to happen, Cam Akers and Madison are going to split usage. Maybe Cam Akers runs away with the job, but Cam Akers has also been one of the least efficient guys oh, yeah. coming off of his torn Achilles. So I can see like this just being a bat fight on the most pass-heavy team in the league and both might uh, end up unconscious. So the answer is go get Jordan Addison now while there's still a potential buy low window. Okay, New England Patriots. I don't have really any notes here other than this team is playing with a lot of pace. Like a lot of people ask what Bill O'Brien was going to bring here. I think we're seeing it both on the field, but maybe like the superstar that we expected to hopefully imitate his same explosiveness from last year in Ramondre Stevenson. It's just not happening so far through three games. And I don't know if that like comes back during the season, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know what exactly is up with Ramondre. He just looks slower to me. And when you're looking at the chart, Zeke Elliott, it's not just like garbage time stuff. Like Zeke Elliott's carries are like right in the middle of the game. They're yeah. kind of rotating drives. You get Zeke Elliott out there in this two minute drill for this last week. It's it's tough to to kind of decipher what exactly is the issue. The offensive line is playing, I think fair enough ball um, to make Bill O'Brien's offense work. I think that the pass catchers will bounce back like just based off of the matchup, but there's so many guys involved. Juju's not a full-time participant. The actual guy that is, is Devonte Parker. I think that someone like Parker and Hunter Henry are going to have better games when they're not playing the jets, when they are in, in catch up mode. Um, but we just need more usage and like more explosiveness for Ramondre Stevenson. So that, I agree. It is on my radar. I, I don't know exactly what's up though. New Orleans Saints, Alvin Kamara is back from his suspension. Now, almost certainly Jameis Winston is going to start this week. It's like a sprained AC joint for Derek Carr right now. Low-key excited about a Alvin Kamara, Chris Olave, Derek Carr offense because from the top down, Things are changing a little bit with Dennis Allen and this offense. They're playing with a bit more pace. They're going for it on some fourth downs as well. Um, we spoke about how this team, after investing in Jamal Williams and Kendra Miller this offseason, might take more away from Alvin Kamara. It's almost to the point it's the opposite, where I think they're lacking a bit of juice there, a bit of stability, and I think Alvin Kamara is the one that's going to bring it. Yeah, I think he's going to slide right back in there, so... I haven't done my running back rankings yet. I think I'm going to start with him as my running back 16 and then kind of work from there. But I think that he's definitely in the mix. Kendra Miller didn't run away from the job last week. I think that's kind of like the big storyline there. And uh, Michael Thomas, Rashid Shahid, Chris Olave, Jawan Johnson, Alvin Kamara. There's enough talent here to to warrant some production. But at the same time, like is Jameis that guy? Is this coaching staff enough to get all of them home consistently? That's going to be something we're going to have to learn. Did not realize that Rashid Shahid has almost two more fancy points per game than Michael Thomas did. Obviously, last week it was on a punt return, if that counts mm -hmm. for your league or not. Um, 
He's just the wide receiver 38 right now. Michael Thomas, the wide receiver 44. I am nervous how this offense is going to look with Jameis Winston at quarterback. Like, I yeah. think so many people are used to that air it out, make, you know, Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, the wide receiver two and three overall mm -hmm. in the season. That was also when he had 30 interceptions to go along with 30 touchdowns. I think since that period of time, he has attempted to be reeled in a little bit. And again, I'm partially afraid that this is going to lead to more Taysom Hill than we all want in week four as well. I don't like that. That's that's scaring me. Um, yeah, and also this defense is like very good. So yep. like, will they allow Jameis Winston to have those turnovers? We shall see. New York Giants. Yeah, nothing's going well. Nothing's going well. Like you can throw out a couple of Jalen Hyatt plays. We can throw in some Darren Waller stuff. Saquon Barkley's injured. It's still, you know, a difficult run out for Daniel Jones. And even when he doesn't or have a difficult matchup, then doesn't play well in the first half against the Arizona Cardinals. This is one of those situations where I believe the coaches are good. I believe that their attempts at lifting this offense versus what it was last year was in good faith, but it's three weeks. It's all been bad. It's a tough stretch of the season. And I don't know when it is going to turn around. They are missing their star left tackle. They're missing set, uh, a guard. They're missing a legit X wide receiver. Darren Waller is the tight end 10 and routes has not been a difference maker while playing through his hamstring. And Daniel Jones was efficient last year because of the ground game. So curious to see if that's going to be something that they're going to get going. Wondell Robinson returned. Um, which is is going to really cloud up these wide receivers. This offense is just not good enough for the wide receivers to matter anyways, though. Yeah, they do get the Seattle Seahawks this week, and we saw what Andy Dalton did to them. So, like, again, this is another opportunity to potentially turn around because then in the next two weeks, it's the Dolphins and the Bills, and that's difficult. By the way, people's infatuation with Wondell Robinson is wild to me. Like, he is it purely is. a slot wide receiver. Yeah, it really is. Like, this is no Tank Dell that we're talking about here. Okay. New York Jets. I mean, having these two back to back is just a fun conversation. Um, I do love your point on where Brees Hall has improved his snap rate over the last three weeks. And now we're at about what 50% of the running back snaps and to be on the lookout for a national text message that, Hey, the offense is going to be built around Brees Hall because that is going to be the only time that you can start him until it gets to that point. Yeah, and then even when he does get to that point, is this offensive line good right. enough? Is Brees Hall good enough? Like, since that long carry, he's, like, the worst in PFF grade. He's averaging, like, two yards per attempt. I do think a lot of that is because they're zeroing in on him. The offensive line is banged up and really bad. So I think even if Brees Hall is, quote, unlocked, I still think it's going to be very hard for them to get there just because, of, as a reminder, the Jets are 31st in running back usage. They are... 30th in wide receiver usage. They are dead last in neutral pass rate. And then even when they are doing what they can, it's still not going to be effective. So I guess like we'll, we'll have to change our opinions on this. Like if they do make a quarterback change, but like if it's Carson Wentz off the street, is that like really going to be the big difference? Well, maker, Trevor Simeon, who they brought in today. I mean, so is, if that's that the, the answer, answer? <laughs> like, do we have an answer? You know what I mean? I hear you. Pittsburgh Steelers up next quickly. Pat Frymuth was more involved. Four targets, three receptions, 31 yards, and a touchdown. Anything you want to say about the Steelers? This is a rough stretch of teams to discuss. I got to be honest. I will say, moving forward, they've had a very difficult defense. It's moving forward, George Pickens, I think he's like the one that actually sticks out to me, plays Houston, the Ravens, the Rams, the Jaguars, and the Titans next. At least for the next month, those are some exploitable pass game matchups it's just been so uncreative it's like i mean come on scripted plays are that bad yeah the nerds out there on twitter are just incredible people you all make some fantastic charts this one um shows the scripted plays which are the first 15 of an nfl game the success rate of those versus all the others for the rest of the game matt canada needs to uh light the scripts on fire because look how worse he is in comparison to everyone else versus like Look at Sean Payton and the Denver Broncos, how he can script everyone successfully early on. And then when it's like time to actually call plays and Russ to not know the first 15 that it's going to happen, uh, it's abysmal after that. And then in every chart you're going to see on football Twitter every single Tuesday, uh, the Miami Dolphins are locked into the top right corner. It's facts. 
It's science. It's facts. Um, do you think that like we're already seeing Jalen Warren totally close the gap on Najee Harris? Do you think it's going to get to a point when it's a set it and forget it player for Jalen Warren to be in starting lineups? I, I don't think so until there's an injury. Um uh, it was Najee still getting a larger majority of the opportunities. And I think that the size will still lean Najee at the goal line uh, over Jalen Warren. And like, even if it is the case, the Steelers are 28th in running back usage. Like I think that there's a chance that goes up uh, because they're at matchups early on the season. I've been discussing, like I said, the schedule really opens up soon, but like, I mean, are we that excited to start Jalen Warren here? I mean, the split backfield on the Steelers, like you're not winning your league. If you're starting Jalen Warren. San Francisco 49ers, a team that features the wide receiver seven in points per game with Brandon Ayuk, the wide receiver eight in points per game, and Debo Samuel, I believe the tight end seven in George Kittle so far this season. It's Brock Purdy. Every time he plays, uh, he's going to throw for two touchdown passes and also features a great running game with a running back two overall in Christian McCaffrey. The math just gets so much easier when one of the guys are out, you know, like Debo Samuel season high, George Kittle season high, McCaffrey still doing his thing once Ayuk was out. So we'll see if Ayuk's going to return back to play. But like I'm, the math is just so much, it's so much easier to do rankings when one of the pieces is, is out of there. Did you know that um, Donald Parm is the tight end six so far this yeah. season on like eight targets, six receptions, minimal yards because he has three touchdowns. Like, Again, just speaks to the landscape of the position. As somebody that has been touting Joshua Kelly, the Donald Parham two-yard line touchdowns have been quite tilting. Yes. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So, we were waiting for it, to be honest. we You could see it coming, the cracks forming, but the ship still going in the right direction until this Bucks offense hit the Philadelphia Eagles in week three. And you saw Rashad White be a totally inefficient runner, uh, I think, though, it shows that even when things go poorly from like an offense standpoint and a team winning standpoint, Mike Evans is probably going to get there in like Ooh. an every single. I mean, how ridiculous was that catch over the middle, the one hander in traffic? And then in like the red zone uh, at like the two yard line, they were under center with Rashad White and Mike Evans was isolated on the bottom. And it was like, don't even fool anyone. You're throwing this thing up to Mike Evans. You didn't even run like a fade to the corner, cuts that thing back inside like. Man, Mike Evans still has the juice. Like it's so evident for the first three weeks. So Mike Evans, wide receiver five and wide receiver 14 usage. The the gap between Evans and Godwin, both in the numbers and to, on the tape to me, is like really, really, really distant. So unless there's a new injury or something, I would not expect those two to be ranked anywhere close to each other, even though we were drafting them the exact opposite of the offseason. Yeah, like I, I don't expect it to go horribly wrong for the Buccaneers throughout the rest of the season. They could go wrong in bad games. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think it points out that even when we've had good performances by the team and bad ones, Chris Godwin has had 7.6, 8.3, and 6.7 points. And compare that to Mike Evans, 15.6, 26.1, and 14.5. So mm -hmm. uh, I got that one wrong this summer. That one's for sure. Tennessee Titans. I think this is a team that's like really tough to get a feel for if they're going to be able to turn around and be relevant for our standards this year. I don't like, think it's difficult. Well, I, I, I think I think it's I think they're just down horrendous, man. Like with Peter Skaronsky out, it is a disaster on the offensive line. And like we're still trying to get answers. Why did they sign Dillard? Like that fit well, made because he's on the list. Yeah, but I mean, we got to throw out the list on occasion, and uh, I think Vrabel has never seen that list, doesn't want to talk about your list in no, any he capacity. Hates analytics. Yes, um, I don't know. This seems just too bad, like all across the board. Like Traylon Burks is not taking the development that we need. Chig is the player that I feared that he was just gadget plays, yards after the catch ability, but we regress that. Not a difference maker. DeAndre Hopkins just is not on the same page with Ryan Tannehill. Tannehill doesn't look himself. Derrick Henry, career worst, broken tackle rate. My question is, why not trade Derrick Henry? Like, why keep him? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a pretty stark difference when he's also down in yards per carry, and that can mean a lot of things. That can be offensive line blocking, can be individual talent. Mm -hmm. and we're probably getting both of those this year. So, like, when you don't create the offensive environment to give him 20 touches, then this is probably the outcome that we're going to get right yeah. now with it. 
I would say just in case they do trade Derrick Henry, make sure you have Ty J because oh, yeah. he, he makes a couple splash plays where you can at least see it with him. I he'll still have the same issues as like, if Derrick Henry's having issues, Ty J will also have some issues here. Um, I, I'm not optimistic at all. Let's close with the Washington Commanders. I went back and watched all of Jahan Dotson's routes. And <laughs> I, I seriously did. Because look, I, I told people to draft him. They drafted him. The preseason told people to draft him. They drafted him. And it's a Sam Howell problem, to be honest. And yes. I also think it's a bit of an Eric enemy problem because mm-hmm. there's times where wide receivers are forced to get mandatory outside releases. And it just means they are there to push off coverage and they aren't a part of the progression. And Jahan Dotson is being asked to do that way too often. And for that reason, he doesn't have the right to get open. And then when he does on this slant in the red zone, he's to the primary side of the field read for Sam Howell gets wide open with the whole middle of the field. And Sam Howell just looks in the different direction. I don't get it. I don't know what happened to that dynamic that we saw but Jahan Dotson, from an opportunity standpoint, is down horrendously right now. Yeah, they spread the ball out. Right now, the Washington tight end group as a whole is, let me check the notes here, number two in the league. It's been uh, Turner. It's been Logan Thomas. But that's made the Washington Commanders as a team. They're 28th in wide receiver usage. So it's same issues that you're having with Dotson that are being applied to Terry McLaurin. And I think Sam Howell is like, fancy baker mayfield or less fancy baker mayfield i don't even know who's fancier than the other but i think that's the big issue here and like some of the schemed up stuff's just going to go the other way and i just think the commander's offense is just not going to be that good this year again though this is like one of those long seasons where last year like obviously jamar chase is a far better talent than john dotson is even though i think john dotson's a talented player Mm -hmm. but he had a rough first three games to last season and then Good offense figures it out. They, you know, start creating advantageous looks and cohesive offensive plays to get their best players open and available and opportunities. You have to think that that's going to happen this year. Like, I do not expect Jahan Dotson to finish with the same fantasy points per game as Chase Claypool the rest of the season. You know, like, I think we look back on it, and I know you're sick of me talking about this, that this is the worst period of the season for, for Dotson. Well, I would hope so. I, I think that he is so good of, as a player that he will be a top 40 or 50 wide receiver, but like a consistent player in this offense, I think to me is asking too much. But the fact that Terry McLaurin hasn't been able to do that by himself, and yeah. now you have two guys that are both very good, makes it hard. I just don't think Sam Howell is good enough. Um, other commanders, no. Brian Robinson. People are actually yelling at me that I was ranking Brian Robinson too low last week. I love Brian Robinson. Like I can appreciate his skill set more than most people, but the game script really matters for Brian Robinson. Last week, he didn't get a touch um, after like the midway points of the third quarter when they were losing. Only runs eight routes, so he saw some of the issues uh, in game scripts. So that's something to keep an eye out when we're doing matchups and rankings uh, going into the later part of the week. Okay, that's it. Complete every single team in an hour and thirty minutes. Shout out to producer Weaves. For handling all the mishaps that we had along the way. Hopefully you all didn't even notice. And I was a dummy and forgot to ask all of you to subscribe to the show. So if you made it this far, I don't know how. Subscribe. Be a part of the 30%. Join us on this wonderful journey that we were on. Go and check out Hayden's fantasy usage model. It's in the description down below. And be on the lookout for our running back tiers on Wednesday. Quarterback wider, uh, quarterback tight end tiers on Thursday. Wide receiver tiers on Friday. And a special edition of Hayden plus Steve Smith tomorrow focusing on the great Keenan Allen and then me and Colt McCoy on some awesome play call setups throughout the league in week three. Last thing I w- was asking Steve about blitzes and the hand signals that you see with quarterbacks in and wide receivers and like what they're actually saying and stuff. So deep into the weeds on that episode. It was fun. Love that. All right. Thank you all for watching up the villa. We'll talk to y'all soon. See ya. <laughs>